And welcome back to the second hour of Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. It is July 15th, 2015. And uh, what we're doing on this show tonight is kind of interesting. It's uh, uh, Ladies Alternative History Night. And uh, last hour we heard from Catherine uh, Children who talked about uh, Shakespeare and the identity of Shakespeare. Now we're going to roll the clock back uh, quite a few centuries to uh, the time when another very famous man walked the earth and uh, <clears throat> the mysteries behind the female muse of the man that we knew as uh, Jesus the Christ, Yeshua or Issa. Um, there is a mythology within all of this and what I believe for a long time it is, is an encoding of the sacred feminine that has actually and actively been suppressed by the hierarchies of religion, specifically the Roman Church, in an attempt to uh, basically suppress some of the mysteries, the mysteries behind um, the spiritual state of humanity that now are coming to the surface. My guest tonight for this hour, Gloria Amendola, is an author and intuitive who um, travels internationally and speaks to audiences about the Holy Grail mysteries and their connection to the secret destiny of America. Um, she is uh, a trained group facilitator, and she blends the Western tradition of research and evidence with the Eastern path of meditation and going within for answers. You and I are going to get along real well on this show. Gloria Amendola, welcome to Off Planet TV. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. I am too. You know, just the idea that uh, you, you, you actually hit, um, in, in, in reading your bio here, the idea of going within, um, that is the hallmark of my own spiritual foundation. And you, I'm very interested to talk about uh, Mary Magdalene, because I think she's a pivotal figure who has, as I said, been suppressed and um, lied about, quite frankly. And you have, oh my three, you have, you have three books that you've written uh, on on the Magdalene um, that uh, go deeply into this. Mary Magdalene, the first century avatar. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and tell us how you came to become interested in Mary Magdalene. Well, I think I was a, a truth seeker my whole life, um, and I was raised Catholic, so I had religion ingrained in me from a very early age uh, in in the Catholic tradition. Mm. And I remember when I, you know, talk about consciousness and going within, I remember when I was nine years old, I started to have what I was experiencing as visitations from Yeshua or Jesus. <laughs> and I thought that was great because that was my religion. That was, you know, what I was exposed to. And here I was having these visitations. So I remember running out of my bedroom and telling my mom and dad, wow, guess what? Jesus is visiting me. And we talked about things and oh my god did they did they shut it down immediately it was so beyond their understanding and um they just let me know that 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 whole experience what i was talking about uh, they didn't want any part of it really wasn't happening and i got the message somehow i understood at nine years old that I was still going to have these experiences, but I wasn't going to share them with anyone because nobody around me uh, seemed to understand that whole experience. So many years went by. That's why I say I've always been a truth seeker because I had that experience so early on. So I tried to live an outwardly semi-normal life anyway, but my inward life was very rich and very interesting. And fast forward many, many years later, you know, having studied dream time and um, mm -hmm. astral projection and you know, psychic phenomenon, paranormal. I remember um, going to church with a friend, and I remember it was a fundamentalist church, and I had already gone beyond my Catholic religion, and I was looking at other churches and just trying to understand what, what was really going on in them, and why was it so different than the Jesus who would appear to me and teach or tell me things that were so radically different. And I remember somebody mentioning the Mother Mary in one of these uh, masses or services, and they shut it down, and they said, we won't talk about that, we're just going to talk about Jesus, Jesus, 
Christ Jesus. And that was the last visit for me at that particular church. And I think churches in general and really letting go of religion. And I said, you know what? I, my background, um, some of my background was in theater. I'm going to write a play about a woman in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. It didn't matter. I just needed to hear those voices and go deeper in. And that's when Mary Magdalene came to me. I had many books on my dining room table as I tell the story. And it was like a hologram opened and she jumped out and said, pick me, pick me. And, and so I wrote a play about her and I live in the greater New York city area. I live in Connecticut, but you know, really kind of a far suburb of the city, if you will. Um, and I went into the city and I workshopped it and, you know, I thought that would be it. And I'd write another play. And 15 years later, here I am still decoding the mysteries on so many different levels that have opened up around my research and experience with her. Now, in in your in your first book, um, you you talk a lot about um, the revelations that you were given by Mary, specifically relating to um, well civilizations of Egypt and Atlantis. These are connections that most people don't make within the context of the historical Bible, because uh, well. Let's face it, and I, I have a theological background, so I can say with great certainty, having studied the 66 books of the canon, that there are huge holes in the chronology of the scriptures that you oh have God, to get outside. Holes. Right, exactly. So, you know, you have a problem with using it as a history book it, because it seems to me any more like a patchwork. And I'm not, I'm not denigrating the Bible per se, what I'm saying is that we have an incomplete picture. So in, in your first book, you're really uh, getting information that would inform the reader as to the backdrop of this, this history? The, the trilogy on Mary Magdalene is a channeled work. So for your mm -hmm. audience, that is when you pretty much dial into the frequency. It's like picking a radio station. You know, you dial into something, and through through the course of many years of channeling her privately, I you know learned how to connect through channeling in my intuitive work with what I do to a a, a frequency or a signature that I recognize as her. And it was her in, in it was her talking to me and me asking questions. And the reason why it was uh, um, I. Chose the name First Century Avatar was because this idea of Mary Magdalene being this prostitute whom Jesus saved and then she went out and preached the word is is absolute dogma, if you will. And both Jesus and Mary Magdalene, a more accurate picture of them was that they were very well connected in the world and they had certain privileges. And part of that meant that they could go to different areas and they could study the mysteries or they could study in the mystery schools. And in that relation in the, in the pathway of Isis in ancient Egypt, that's what Magdalene was connected to per my work, whereas Yeshua, uh, because of Uncle Joseph there and his shipping, uh, empire that he had um, right, yeah. he, he could hang out with the Druids in the UK or he was in the Far East he, they, they were moving around they were pretty uh, evolved souls and they learned a lot about the hidden knowledge that was um, encoded in, in traditions and mystery schools so, so that's their backdrop so again, you know, we don't have the big picture in the Bible. You're you're talking there about Joseph of Arimathea, is that correct? Correct. And Joseph I mean, we know he was a tin trader for the Roman yes. Empire. Yes. You know, he was he was more of like a um, a Donald Trump figure in his day. Not not <laughs> the not the brash Donald. I don't mean that part, but very successful, very well known. He was a Mercurio. He was also part of the Sanhedrin, so he was part of the priesthood. But Joseph, in secret, was an Essene. And the Essenes are really key to this whole story. Absolutely. And Jesus and Mary Magdalene came through that community. Um, they were they were a a community that was located all over the place, certainly all over the Mediterranean. So you don't find this stuff by reading the Bible. You have to dedicate your life to reading lots and lots of texts and piecing together the history. 
One of the things that informed my background was, and I did this early, probably as a teenager, as I was kind of walking away from my established religion, of reading what were called then forbidden books of the Bible, the the uh, the lost books of the Bible, but more importantly, the Gnostic books really came into play in terms of of getting a different picture of Jesus and what we really saw in the Bible and the picture that was painted of him as kind of this, well, almost legalistic figure, although I don't think he comes off like that when I read the Gospels. I think it's the works that were built around him. But the picture of of Yeshua as being uh, a philosopher, somebody who had a deep understanding of uh, probably Far East as well as Near East philosophies and mystery, yeah, school, mystery school teachings. The Essenes interest me a lot. Talk a little bit about the Essenic side of uh, Mary and Jesus. Well, you know, they, God, there's so much to say. I mean, they would have come through the Essene community, so they would have understood, they would have been privy to the, you know, the massive amount of scrolls that the, that the Essenes were known to collect. And it wasn't just, um, it, it was a broad base of knowledge they went in search of. They were looking for some very specific information. A lot of it went back to ancient Egypt and even the legendary Atlantis. And I, I will even go on further on a limb because I think you can appreciate this. I do believe that when we get to Enoch and, and people like that, we're, we're actually getting into ancient technologies and ancient alchemy. Yes. Yes, and and they were they were exposed to all of that, and so they were masters. There there is um, a part that I channel in the I believe it's in the second volume more so than the third. The, Mary talks a lot about their time with the Druids, not just his time, but their time with the Druids and how they they like to go there. Uh, and this was in Britain and, and perhaps in Wales, but I, I you know she's identifying Britain and mm-hmm. she talks about how they had they were so free there because in the druid society the men and the women were equal so so yeshua didn't have to worry about mary being um persecuted or tormented if you will uh she could be who she was as an equal and they could have these great debates and they would be in the woods and they would be doing things with the druid masters and they would be learning and mary talks about how the druids really wanted to hear about her time in Egypt and uh, the teachings uh, through the pathway of Isis. They were very interested in all that. So it's really fun as she talks about how Yeshua loved trees and he loved the moisture of Britain and the and the, the environment and the nature uh, which was so different from the, where they were from. So the, that's one thing that as she brought through in, in the channeling that I've really never read and it just so deeply resonated not only with me but many, many people who have read my books um it it, there's just such a level of uh it's like you're right there listening to their experiences with the druids as one uh advanced group in in the celtic culture so yes world travelers they basically were uh assimilating the culture around them at that time from a much broader context than simply what we're led to believe was the the Hebrew or more correctly the Jewish aspects of it. Well, that's true. I mean, you know, one thing the the Essenes had to be really careful about what they were doing in the Holy Land because the I talked about that Sanhedrin yes. and how the Pharisees and the Sadducees were set up as more more the temple priests, you know, uh, that, that sort of thing. And so they had their role, and of course we had Roman occupation, and then we had this very secretive cult, that, cult group, I mean, you know, um, the Essenes, that even within the Essenes there were different levels of information um, and it's even believed that Jesus and Mary Magdalene, Joseph of Arimathea, Mother Mary, um, perhaps Lazarus, a, a few other key players were like the core inner circle. 
and then they built their protection around them. So the Essenes had to be very secretive about what they were doing, even in their time. So it's never a simple cut and dried um, uh, you know, history is actually, when you delve into it, as you know, is very complex. And so yeah. even within the Essenes, within the Holy Land, there were such competing, um, well, I, I don't even know if I would say it was competing, but the traditional Jews at the time were really scoping out the Essenes. They wanted to know that what they were up to because they were definitely uh, holding a whole different mindset. They were definitely, they understood a lot more than history gives them credit for, uh, and a lot of advanced knowledge. And when we get history, certainly from the last 2,000 years, it's pretty dumbed down. It's pretty stripped of its power. But people like Jesus and Mary Magdalene in their inner circle, and then the Essenes, they were dealing with very powerful, not only concepts, but um, abilities and that they had. And technology, from what I'm given to understand. That in fact yeah. the Essenes possessed what we would call exotic technologies, and that they were, they were, they existed near the Dead Sea. Is that correct? The yes, Sea but there were other settlements. You know, the, right. the Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran, were probably the more major settlement, if you will. But mm -hmm. but it, it, you know, there were other areas. Um, where scrolls were being copied and sent to, and there were secretive uh, deposits and backups. They were a very diligent people, and they were really protecting the knowledge they had. I call them the guardians of the grail because they were really protecting a very powerful and ancient knowledge that I believe Enoch was very privy to, and he, it was placed in the vaults underneath the temple in Jerusalem, um, and a lot of people have looked for that information for a very long time. It's powerful stuff. And they were privy to Go ahead. No, I'm just saying they were privy to it, and, and I think that's what made them so powerful in their technique and in their ability, and in the fact that they were so highly conscious. Uh, but again, look at the world they were born into. I want to go into the grail a little bit and whatever you would like to share about it, because this is a, a mystical aspect that actually it connects us back to, well, Europe, and obviously connects us to the Arthurian legend of the grail and what the grail is. But the grail actually in the Gnostic traditions is something mysterious. Um, what is your sense of what the grail was, what it represents? Some people argued that it was a cup. Others have said that it was uh, a form of knowledge that was encoded, that uh, there's just legends all over the place. What, what is your sense of the grail and how does it connect uh, mm -hmm. between the time of Yeshua and bringing us into what we consider the Arthurian mythologies? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I, I've actually been researching the Grail for about three years now. Um, at some point, I will put out a book. It's you know I'm working on. It's a very slow process because it's such a massive subject. But the Grail becomes different things in different periods of time. You know what was what was thought to be the Grail in the medieval time is not what the Grail was thought to be in other times. I think for me the one thread that I can apply to what is the Grail to me if I had to take a common thread in all of it I would say that common thread or that element that runs through the Grail is consciousness. But ultimately, if you go back to the ancient world, there is this idea that the grail is actually a stone. Um, that, that's in other legends as well, but a different kind of stone. So in other words, if I go back to some of the real intriguing possibilities of what the grail is in the very ancient world, so we're going back to Atlantis, we'll, we'll use that as a marker name, and we'll go back a couple hundred thousand years, I think that there were certain elements on the face of the earth that 
were imbued with um, qualities that we would say almost are not of this world. Re- remember in, in the, I'll try to make this simple. Remember in the movie Avatar yes. that we were harvesting a, uh, harvesting a stone off planet that right. levitated? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, James Cameron, who made that film, he's like, a, he's, he's, he understands esoteric knowledge. And yeah, I think he's a does. Yeah. degree Mason, right? So, you know, they put things in movies. We all know that. And so I, I do believe in it's perhaps it's early it's inception is that it was some form of stone, perhaps that really wasn't of this world you know we can connect the stars into all of this ultimately um and then it becomes something different throughout time i i don't know well I this mean, is I, off planet radio so um this is the place to talk about it um, yay i mean yay. This is, you know with really um i'm very interested in that concept because it does go back to atlantis um <clears throat> some of the legends of atlantis hold that Atlantis was using stones, specifically crystals, um, as energy forms to power their civilization. And in fact, it was the misuse of these these stones that contributed to the collapse of Atlantis. And again, we're dealing with legends. Um, I don't know, did Mary tell you anything about this? Does she inform any of that background in terms of either the off-world origins of things or um, presence of, of, of the stone in, in any of the other ancient ancient civilizations. She does at one point, I think it's in volume three, she does talk about a stone that she was gifted. It came down through her family. It came down through her lineage. And I, I because I don't have a volume three in front of me, I actually had to sell my copy to someone who really wanted it but um, <laughs> she talked about uh, the, this stone that is gifted to her and this will blow your mind this is you know I think you can handle this so I'm, I'm going to actually put it out there she talks about having guardianship of this stone that has come down through time and she intimates her you know that it goes back basically to Atlantis. We'll use that marker again. And it's a stone of great power. So this is no ordinary stone. And there are some legends that say Jesus had one, but in in her story, in what I've channeled, she talks about it. And she talks about having the use of it for for a while. And it has power that's way beyond our understanding. And she talks about having to return it to its rightful place because that as a guardian or a steward of it it had to be returned to where it belonged and get this it's basically said that she in in Yeshua and um probably through Joseph helping them that they returned this stone and she says it's in America that was where I wanted you to take us because there's something else going on with that. I I noticed that you were tying this together with the destiny of America. And um, I was very interested in that concept because, you know, sometimes Americans, we kind of feel like we're this Heinz 57 variety Mongol dog of a nation because we're we're such a melting pot. And yet there is this this heritage that sits in the background that there's a connectiveness there's something about america that is a quest for a lot of people or it certainly was historically so can you tell us a little bit about that well she talks about them returning this stone i can tell you as a templar researcher and, and a Templar, I am actually a Templar in Rennes Chateau, France. So I mean, I'm really, I really breathe the fabric of what they were doing, and I do believe that the Templars were really an evolution of the Essenes. And there's a lot of reasons why, um, you know, they were all they were all practicing resurrection rituals, and you know, their garb was the same, and their habits were the same, and you know, I could go on and on and on. But the point being is that if you follow the Magdalene mysteries long enough, you will undoubtedly see this imprint of the Knights Templar, and we know the Templars came to America. They 
and they were being persecuted well before they were even being persecuted in France in 1307 they were already traveling around our world was always much more mobile than we've been led to believe that Columbus discovered Absolutely. American Absolutely. Is, is absurd so the, so the Templars the inner now, now remember this is this inner circle so the outer arm yes there's an agricultural branch and there's a, a thinking arm and, and, and all these different aspects of a functioning group that knew how to be successful in this world and so the Templars that inner core they were practicing resurrection rituals they were they, they understood what was going on in ancient Egypt they had privy to some really fascinating information. They revered Mary Magdalene in the House of Bethany. Um, it's amazing. And so as they were moving around, they were in America. There were many people that were in America for, for you know, thousands upon thousands of years. So the, if you look at the way the Templar Order rose to power, and if you look at the way the United States of America rose to power, you will see similarities. And if you look at our founding fathers, you will see their roots into France. You will, you will see them uh, being Freemasons or at least deists. Mm -hmm. And they weren't hung up on religion. They were working with a far deeper MO on what they had to create for this new Atlantis here. Well, you just look at the writings of Jefferson, who is probably my favorite figure. I mean, Jefferson, well, you have the Jefferson Bible. He basically stripped everything else out, kept the words of Jesus. And yes, they were deists uh, for the most part. I believe the Adams were a little bit more to the side of maybe Christianity. But the accusation, and I, I hate that term, that they were just deists, misses the point of mystical Christianity, which I believe was the fuel behind the vision of this nation, both prehistory and later. Well, I agree with that. And if you look, let's just take Benjamin Franklin. We know he was Mason, and we know that he was a master or a grandmaster of the lodge in Carcassonne, France, which is a half an hour outside of Rennes le Chateau, where there is tremendous mystery about the Jesus and Mary story. I mean, it is believed that post-crucifixion they lived there in Rennes les bains and that perhaps they were lands uh, that were titled to Claudia Procula, Punch's Pilate's wife, and, and, and that's why they were there, and, and so on and so forth. So, so, I mean, that's a whole different story. But the point is, is that we can trace Benjamin Franklin right near there, and we know they were spending time in France and in Paris, and we know they were around shakers and movers. And, and it is my belief that they understood the heresy that Jesus was married and had, you know, to Mary Magdalene, and they had a bloodline. And, and even more, that he didn't die on the cross. Um, you know, that's a, that's a widely held belief in, in the esoteric circle. So, and, and it's a very compelling case, and, and, and we, could, we could do a whole show just on that. So the idea, and then we know Thomas Jefferson, when he took a, a, a ride through the canal area in the Languedoc, he writes to his daughter, this is on his website, it's good to be back in the land of corn, wine, and oil, which is a Masonic reference. Now, we can't, we can't definitively say, say that Jefferson was a Mason, but he certainly held certain ideals that even go beyond their understanding of that, and it seems to me that they were more initiated, if you will, and that they were creating an experiment here, an idea that we had to grow into as a people, and we are growing into it. Tell me what you understand about the differentiation between the Templars and the Masons. I understand that the Masons come much later, although <clears throat> theoretically the order was very old, going back to Solomon. Um, in terms of uh, influence on the underpinnings of culture, and specifically the United States, where do those two groups fit together, in your understanding? Well, in masonry, they have Templar orders, 
and 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 in masonry they're telling a story of enoch they're telling a story of the templars there's a templar degree what masonry is to me and i am not i don't claim to be an expert i have friends who are um from what i can determine they were were pulling from the templars they were pulling from rosicrucianism they were pulling from the essenes you know they they all who you know we can we can make arguments all kinds of arguments and waste people's time on when this was discovered or when yeah. the masons actually appeared in England or were they in Scotland and all that craziness. The point is is that there's a group that has always existed for thousands. I I will say thousands of years. <clears throat> At least we'll say two thousand. Although I, I I do know it's more because it goes back to ancient Egypt and resurrection rituals. There was always a group of people who kept the ancient knowledge alive. I call them the guardians of the grail. And so I think the Freemasons were probably the more modern representation of all of that ancient knowledge that became so veiled that so many people today who are Masons don't even know it. Like they, they memorize these degrees and these initiations, but they have no idea what it, what they're doing. So well, I think, but I think outer, our founding what, fathers do quite well. Yeah, I think this is what you would call the outer court. And this is actually referenced in the scriptures, the inner court, the outer court, the Holy of Holies, which is kind of this triadic temple-type structure that I believe is a metaphor for orders of initiation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I believe that there's always been an inner circle. I always I believe that that those who are deeply initiated um, are the ones who have really dedicated their lives to this. They may be they may be. I mean, I've met people in current day of the of the bloodline of the Jesus and Mary bloodline. I mean, they're out there. Um, it, you know, there there is a bloodline that's known. Maybe they're part of the inner circle. Who knows? But but the bottom line is, and what this really is all about it, you know we can get off on bloodline families and, and even with George Washington and you know some of our founders there you know you'd be surprised what they really did know and, and why they had the passion to do what they were doing envision this whole new concept of a country you know called America but I mean the bottom line of all of this has always been that there would be a time that time being now, uh, a cosmological uh, influence that would create a revolution that at this time is more of a spiritual evolution going on, and it's going on all over the world. Yes, it is. And, yes. and that was, you know, America being the secret destiny, you know, the whole Manly P. Hall thing. It's really about perfecting ourselves. You know, Da Vinci, the Vitruvian man, it's about it's about the chakras and the energies and the Kundalini and the pineal gland. And it's about perfecting ourselves to become a higher evolved version of who we are, you know, biologically as much as spiritually. That's always been what's been driving the deep inner circles of this knowledge. And I think America was set up as a place in which you could be free, and we'll just use that word for the moment, to to uh, live in, in, in peace and prosperity, if you will, and equality, and go from there and evolve. You know, this work and process of evolving and you know you know even with all its flaws and even with all the difficulties that we face you know uh with our corporatocracy right now we're still doing it people are still doing that they are making those steps to a spiritual evolution it's pretty wild it is actually i've said for a long time <clears throat> that we're being forged in the fires of tribulation right now and i don't mean that quite the way the Bible or people who believe in the Bible mean it, but that we are in extraordinary times and that it requires, well, it's the contrast. It, the veil is being rent. I mean, you just look around the world. I talk to hundreds of people a year from all different walks of life who report, you know, their awakenings, their spiritual journey, their spiritual journey, which is painful. And yet at the same time, it's ecstatic. It's almost like we have to go through 
this painful side in order to get to the ecstasy of awakening both separately and corporately well it's true and you know um, one of my tours when I go to the Renle Chateau area I call it initiation because I take people to landscape points that are very powerful with telluric current and energy and Ormus filled waters and uh, I could go on and on and all these earth elements and so forth and it's it, it, and what I do is I try to work on their energy bodies and take them to places that may trigger memories so that they can wake up and they could or some of them are already awake but they could go deeper into their experience it's, it's just an extraordinary place that really makes that awakening happen but but when I call it initiation and we go back to when when we began and we were talking about Jesus and Mary Magdalene being these people who had opportunity and they were able to study advanced concepts and train um, they had to undergo initiation that was part of you know the temples on the Nile were based on the seven chakra system some of the great cathedrals from Santiago de Compostela in Spain to Rawson Chapel in Scotland are based on a seven chakra system initiations learning how to master the issues the um, frequencies, the, the, the our brain, our heart, the way it all connects together, in these in these steps of initiation where we do purify and we do move from our lower selves and being ruled by fear and and uh, programmed beliefs to breaking free, and then really living in a much more multi dimensional, multi sensory experience. I mean, that's been going on for a very long time. So it is process of initiation, and it's very, very important because we couldn't, we couldn't, at least in this, you know, maybe in a thousand years, but we couldn't, in terms of biocircuitry, jump from A to Z and sustain it. We have to go through steps of initiation. And are we doing that both individually and, and as, a, as a race right now? We're, we're kind of in, a, in an initiation of the race, um, but at the same time, we're, we're feeling it, and many people are feeling it on an individual level. Do you see this as a, a very long arc, or are we on a faster track right now? I think we're on a faster track than we realize. And one thing Magdalene says in the Channel Trilogy, she said, if you could see the light from where we are, you would be amazed. She says, turn off your televisions. What they're telling Please. you, they're not reporting yes. the Great Awakening. She said, yes. there is so much light on the planet, and there are so many people awakening and doing amazing things. She, you know, she, she says that, yes, there's been a great deception, and yes, those who have held the, the purse strings of power for so long are getting desperate and will do anything. But basically, she and Yeshua have said in the channeled material that the cosmological alignments are such is just going to keep happening this awakening and in the cosmological alignment you know post 2012 the positioning of where we're at with galactic center the milky way the you know we've we've you know many people have lost the understanding of how powerful the earth is and the planets and the cosmos but we're deeply yeah. affected by it no matter how much technology we have and we always have been because everything is connected and so the cosmology is on our side now and it and it seems like we've created through our technology through social media through uh, Facebook email the internet we've created the means to be connected globally and so we're ready to see that reflection and that's what's speeding up the process and let me ask you about that, because 2012, <clears throat> there was this gigantic ramp up, and then 2012 came and went, and many people, many people were disappointed. Uh, and I mean that on the level of they actually expected some sort of catastrophic event, or they expected some sort of uh, peak ascension experience. I've held that things did happen. On, on that December 21st date, but that only the people who were able to experience the inward journey and go into their subtle bodies were able to really perceive what was happening and that that was just a trigger point 
for things that we're now beginning to see work out both in the physical but also in the spiritual. How do you view that? How do you view um, what has gone forth since December 21st, 2012? And if Mary Magdalene has given us any indication, even prophetically, of what we can expect in the next few years? Ah, so that's a good question. Um, I think you're absolutely right when you talk about those people who could understand more subtle energy bodies definitely knew we were shifting. Cycles were completing. New ones were beginning. We could feel the energies and the downloads, and we knew. But it wasn't, it wasn't a Hollywood movie. You know, even though the yeah. Hollywood movie was made, it, it's yeah. not a Hollywood movie. It's a whole different experience. So I know a lot of people in the metaphysical um, communities who were like t in depression all of 2013. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, they thought, yeah. you know, this grand event didn't happen. And I never felt like it was going to. I felt like it was a whole different level of experience, a more, a more multi sensory. I never felt we were going anywhere. I think a lot of people thought we were going to exit out i i think the real game is planet earth and i think the ascension is spirit penetrating and animating matter to its fullest and so in a lot of the intuitive work i do i see the lower chakras when i when i scan the seven major chakras as the beginning of a reading um which i do for people even even remotely it, they don't have to be standing in front of me i can see the lower chakras it's the three two one that are struggling because it, it's that spirit coming in that heaven and earth and penetrating into matter physical bodies that's the ascension that's what creates the multi-sensory experience and i think a lot of people who just thought you know we're living in the you know the seventh or eighth chakra or beyond it ain't happening it, we're here in physicality so i think a tremendous amount has happened i think things are really really accelerating does it does that mean that it's a perfect picture no we we have no idea what it's going to look like, but it's definitely happening. I, th I think 2015 is a very important year. I can feel things very much accelerated at this point. And as a matter of fact, yeah. we have the fourth blood moon coming up in the end of September, and that is supposed to be a very prophetic um, point of – um, it depends on what you listen to, but what, but I'll say uh, more expanded consciousness really anchoring in on the planet. Yeah, and there's a lot of fear and doom and gloom out there attached to all of this. And, you know, if you looked at the world with your natural eyes right now, I have to say that, you know, there's a lot of darkness out there. There's a lot of things going on. It looks in a lot of ways like the spiritual ascension of the race isn't really going on if you keep fixed. And it's like you said earlier about the TV, the media, and all of the things that were spoon-fed. When we're viewing that picture, we're really not doing the inner journey, which is the biggest part of all this. Um, yeah. I want to ask you, because, boy, we're running out of time so fast. We, we, have, to, we have to do more of this sometime. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a quote from the Gospel of Thomas. There's actually two here, but I'll fix on this one. And it says, uh, he who knows the father and mother will be called the son of a harlot. And in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus makes allusions to this union of the male and the female as being outside the established order. The sacred feminine has been a, a subject, I think, I've been talking about this for about five years, and I, and I think it's important. I don't think we do it to the exclusion of the male, but it does seem to me like the feminine energy was required to be integrated in order for us to get to another level. What in the Magdalene opus speaks to the sacred feminine and the importance of integrating that into a larger spiritual walk? Well, I think in the pathway of Isis, um, you know, Isis being the ancient Egyptian goddess of fertility, right. sexuality, yeah. so on and so forth. Um, I think, I think what it what it really gets down to, um, because Jesus talks about making the 
male disciples female and making Mary male. And what right. I think he's talking about and what you're what you're alluding to as well is I think that they always understood that within all of us, you know, I'm an embodied female, but I have male energy. You're an embodied male, but you have female energy. It's the currents of the way we're structured. It's just like... It, it's just creative, you know, um, sec- it's it's a way in which creation moves. It can be very sexual. Um, nature can be very sexual in that way, but it, it's creation. And so what what I believe they're talking about is that when we have the, the those currents of energy in our body, the kundalini, the energy going up the spine from that root chakra, that male and female, the left brain, the right brain, as it, as it intertwines, you know, and moves up into the pineal gland it becomes one at that point and there's a whole even in um in the third volume of the magdalene trilogy she talks about uh what baptism really was and it, and it has something to do with these energies that are released in the body and that once the you know the currents that both masculine and feminine um current gets into the pineal gland that the pineal gland in the, in the center of our brain we all have it knows exactly Exactly what to do to secrete certain substances, in, in, in my opinion, biochemistry, and almost signal to our DNA that we're ready for the next level of our experience. Fascinating. Yeah, this, this is really a, a touchstone that has so much imagery to it and so much meaning to it. You, uh, aside from the Mary Magdalene books, you've written several other books. I note. Uh, the Tower and the Dream and The Tower and the Land. Tell us a little bit about those books and how they fit into things. Well, you know, it's kind of a perfect segue um, what they are. There's three more to come. I'm working on three right now. Uh, the third one, The Tower and the Well, Awakening to the Grail. Um, and it takes place a lot in the U.K., uh, which I'm going with groups in, um, in September, October. We're going into England and Wales to find the mysteries deep into Wales, especially. Um, but they're more esoteric thrillers, and they're really more about the character awakening and what she finds. Um, so, so that's what those two are about. I'm also working on a few nonfiction. I won't won't really talk about them yet because uh, they need a little more development. But yeah, it's it's about awakening, and it's a modern day story. But in the beginning of each chapter is a channeled voice, and it brings in a big cast of characters, uh, especially in the first one. And it's that awakening that happens to people, and then the memories that start to come online. And you know, you've either got to go here you've got to read this or be part of this experience and it's it's like our fragmentation of all these lives decides it wants to come back together and make us whole and from that place of wholeness we become very powerful co-creators it's in our it's, it's it's in our biology, and I believe that Yeshua was the outward manifestation of that. Um, Magdalene may have been too, um, and certainly that's why she was given such a hard time. But Magdalene says of Yeshua that in his mastery, he had he integrated all parts of himself from all dimensions, and that was his mastery. Wow, well, I could just sit and think about that for a couple of minutes. That's a pretty powerful statement. Oh, it's really powerful, and when you read this trilogy, and the power that she speaks of, it's like you could see why they were hunted. These books, these books are kind of the conduit for you to bring out these other voices that come through you and give them a place to air. You set them into uh, historical backdrops and, you know, obviously fiction, but at the same time, this is what has bothered me for a long time because some people, frankly, they will freak out when they see that, that, that this is channeled material. Now, I've always said, you know, use discernment with channeled material, but absolutely, let's be honest about this. The people who cite this the most don't realize that the holy books themselves are channeled material. I've said this for years. What were the, I prophets, know you're right. what were the prophets doing? I mean, look at John sitting on the Isle of Patmos having these insane visions that is like it's like the worst eye or maybe the best ayahuasca trip you've ever taken. Or exactly. You, you I mean, look, look at, at this. 
Look at the priests of the Old Testament wearing the yes. breastplate with 12 cosmic stones and then, exactly. you know, connecting and talking to God and oh, getting their answers for people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what, those stones were, those, those were for divination. So, uh, you know, again, I, I'm always cautious, but at the same time, I don't reject channeled material. And I think people need to look at it in the context of their own inner journey. It's just like, uh, I, use tar I use tarot cards, I use rune stones. These are tools for us to be able to understand who we are inside this inner journey, which is rich in symbolism when you tap into it. Oh, it is, and some of those, some of those, uh, you know, especially with the tarot, some of those uh, standard decks, the old decks, those images are meant to trigger you. Absolutely, absolutely. This has been an amazing conversation. We're running out of time rapidly. Is there anything that you would like to leave us with tonight, Gloria? I think I'd like to say to people that you know take heart that the light is growing on planet earth no matter what you're being told people from from grassroots levels all over the world i i travel i talk to them i work with them everybody is waking up and 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 it's a it is an incredible time to be alive and we just we we just have to hold the love in our hearts and keep going i think that's a perfect way to end it my guest for this hour, Gloria Amendola. The website is Gloria hyphen Amendola. Is that correct? Gloria hyphen Amendola. I remember, did yep. my eyes just go out? Gloria hyphen Amendola.com. You'll see it on the screen. It'll be up with the show when we put it up on the websites. You can go there to find these books Mary Magdalene, Revelations of a First Century Avatar. Um, Gloria, we want to do this again. It was an amazing conversation. We just scratched the surface. And we did. It was fun. Yeah, was we could amazing. we could go deep on some of this stuff. We could, and we will do that again very soon. Um, that's going to wrap it up for this week. This is Off Planet TV, Off Planet Radio, the website OffPlanetRadio.com, OffPlanetMedia.net. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside of you. Go look for it. Stand up. Go do something. Time is, uh, well, it's your friend or it's your enemy. Make it that way. Good night and namaste. This is Off Planet Radio.